Hi everyone. In today's video I'm making a bit of a departure from what I would normally do. Uh, for those of you not familiar with my channel, I'm primarily a creepypasta narrator, which means, basically, I'm always on the lookout for the very best news stories to narrate for your listening pleasure. <laughs> I make that sound very simple, don't I? So, um, yeah, like I said, I'm always on the lookout for that next potentially huge creepypasta story. And fortunately, a lot of you out there make it really easy by writing some really great stuff. But the big question is, how do you make that great story? What do you include? What are the essential elements to making the next viral creepypasta. Well, fortunately, a lady by the name of Sarah McGuire has gone all scientific on the issue and has done some research. So in today's video, I'm going to describe that research and I'm going to tell you how it kind of applies to me when I'm selecting a story to narrate. And I'm going to tell you about some of my favorite stories and how they relate to the research she's done. And hopefully, if you're a potential story writer, or if you're writing stories already and you just want to make them better, and you're looking to go viral, this video will help you on your way. Are you ready? <laughs> okay, let's go. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe her research briefly, because we don't want to get too bogged down into in the science and all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, I know that's not what really interests you. Let's just uh, very quickly look at it though, because it is pretty interesting and it's definitely going to help you to write better stories and include the right elements. Okay, so what did Sarah tell us? Fortunately, she's made it very easy and she's compiled this into an infographic. I'll include certain images from the infographic here. As far as I can tell, she's given us permission to use the infographic in this way. And I'm also going to link to it in the information section below the video, so you can go and check it out for yourself. Okay, so, what are the most vital elements to making that next viral creepypasta story? Sarah has highlighted seven key ingredients for a popular creepypasta. So, if you're thinking of starting writing, or if you're already writing, think about it. Which of these are you including in your stories? Which of them have you not even thought about? Okay, so let's start off with this uh, graph, because I know how much everybody loves graphs. <laughs> but this one's pretty simple to read. Okay, so what she's done is she's looked at 72 creepypasta stories across the four main creepypasta sites. That's creepypasta.com, creepypasta.org, the creepypasta wiki, and Creepypasta on Reddit. She deliberately looked at the highest rated ones to get a feel for what people were reading the most. And as you can see, these are the seven elements that she has defined. None of them are completely shocking or much of a surprise, I'm sure. But let's take a look at each in a bit of detail. And like I said, I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna tell you how this relates to me when I'm choosing a story and I'm going to give you an example of a story that I've read, which I'd like you to go back and listen to, obviously, but also to see what I mean when I describe each of these things. Okay, number one, a first-person narrative. What do we mean by first person? This is pretty simple. I, I walked into the room. It was dark. I tried to find a light switch. I couldn't. So what Sarah found was more than two-thirds of the creepy pastors on her list were told in the first person. As opposed to, there was a man. He was in a forest. He got lost. Yada, yada, yada. Boring, boring, boring. Okay? What you're doing by telling the story in the first person is you're putting your reader and the listener, in my case, into the position of the protagonist. 
Slowly but surely, as the story progresses, the reader imagines the story is happening to them. That's the nature of I, of the first person. I walked into the room. It was dark. I tried to find the light switch. I couldn't. Your brain's being tricked. It's being told that this event and these series of actions are happening to you. And believe it or not, that's pretty damn scary after a while. <laughs> okay, so one story that I love by one of my favorite uh, writers, Michael Whitehouse, in which this strategy is employed, is called The Sealed Building. I narrated this a month or two ago. Here it is. Go back and listen to, my, listen to the story, listen to my narration. And this is how effective first-person narrative can be. Number two. Murder. Nearly half the stories on Sarah's list included a murder. Now, why do you think that is? Well, this one's pretty simple, okay? Murder is the ultimate taboo of human civilization. Quite simply, we don't go around killing people very often. So when it happens, it's a bit of a shock. And it's something that we don't experience in our lifetimes. <laughs> Tell me you're not murdering people, folk. Okay, please. Okay, so yeah, that's basically the idea. It's so far removed from our everyday existence that when we read about it, it instantly unsettles us and disturbs us and triggers off something very uncomfortable in our psyche. So that's why half of all the popular, the most popular, have murder in their plot lines. Uh, one deliciously evil story that I read a few months ago was one called My Ward. It's about a prison warder. And not to give too much away, there's a murder involved. Okay, so please go back, give that a listen, and see how effective you think the use of the murder plot device was in that one. Number three. A cliffhanger ending. <laughs> All right, so more than half of the stories that Sarah analyzed had some kind of cliffhanger ending. And this can be an absolutely brilliant plot device because basically you're leaving the reader wanting more. <gasps> what happened? What's going to happen to the victim? Will they survive? And of course, they start putting parts of the unexplained together in their minds. And that is a brilliant thing when it happens because they're finishing the story for you but doing it in their own particular way. And they start talking about it with other people who have different theories. Yada, 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 your story has gone viral. Of course, if you get this wrong, people are just like, what the hell? I didn't understand that. Why did the story not end properly? That was terrible. So if you're an inexperienced writer, or you feel that you just can't get the cliffhanger right, I'd suggest not using this because while it can be brilliant if you get it right, getting it wrong will just end up with a lousy reading experience. Uh, one story that I narrated a while back was one called Train Ride. And in this, you could see something happening and events culminating in a particular way. But the story ended without definitely explaining to you what happened. So you had a pretty good idea in your mind, but at the same time, it wasn't laid out for you. Okay, so go back, give that one a listen, and see how the cliffhanger ending worked in that case. Number four, a monster or supernatural being. Okay, so this is another big element of a lot of the most popular creepypastas. Nearly two thirds of the ones on Sarah's list contains some kind of monster or something supernatural. This can be great for you as a writer because you've got free range. Hey, make it up. What's in your head? Create this being, create this thing. 
no one can tell you it's wrong. Bring it to life in as much depth as you possibly can. Of course, with this being such a popular plot device, a lot of people are doing this, and it's getting more and more difficult to find a new angle, something new to scare people with. So bear that in mind as well. So many times I read a story and I'm like, oh God, this reminds me of Slender Man or Jeff the Killer. Okay, this has all been done before. So coming up with a new slant, something new, is going to be tricky. One story I read um, way back in January, and which is the most popular story on my channel, is another one by Michael Whitehouse, who I mentioned was my uh, favorite author. This one was called Tunnels. And it's, <laughs> it takes place in some tunnels, surprisingly <laughs> enough. Okay, but there's a beautiful um, supernatural element to this. And all the time you're thinking, well, is this real? Could this actually just be a person? Or is it definitely something beyond the normal? And that's the kind of balance you want to get. Could this just be a person? Or is it something supernatural? So go back to tunnels. Like I said, it's my most uh, popular uh, narration on my entire channel. So I must have done something right. <laughs> Although I give more credit to the author than I do to my narration. Number five, an unexplained phenomenon. This is, and with good reason, perhaps the most popular element of any popular creepypasta story. Nearly three quarters of all the most popular creepypastas have something unexplained in them. Now, that sounds really vague, doesn't it? But of course it is, okay? Just incorporate something that leaves something to the reader's imagination. People are quite willing to suspend their belief, or I should say, suspend their disbelief, and just say, okay, I accept for the purposes of this story that this particular thing might be possible. The important thing is that it should leave a lasting impression or have a major influence on the plot. One story I recorded a couple of months ago called Dream Sketch, uh, used this plot device extremely well. It was about a device that enabled people to see what was happening in other people's dreams, and it led to awful consequences. So um, this again, um, like certain other things, like the cliffhanger ending, can be utter garbage if you don't use it very well, because it's so common. But it can be an essential and compelling part of a good creepypasta if you do it well. Number six, a creepy image. Okay, this and number seven are less popular, but still significant parts of a lot of the best creepypastas. What do we mean by a creepy image? Well, quite simply, it's the notion of a photograph that contains weird or unexplainable elements. This can be a really effective plot device because we live in the information age. Um, so much of what we do and how we communicate is visual. So we're always looking at images, we're always looking at pictures, and we interpret them as we do. So to, to have it in a story can be, quite, can be really effective because you can describe a picture quite well and in quite a lot of detail. And people will then use their imaginations to construct this image in their minds. And again, that's a beautiful thing if you get that right, because people will be interpreting what you're saying and thinking, hmm, what's happening here? Only about a quarter of the most popular creepypastas include images, but nevertheless, it's something worth considering. Uh, one story that I narrated that used this was one called findme.jpg in which an image appeared and then reappeared over the course of a number of years with slight changes to it. And these slight changes were what made the story compelling because in your mind you're trying to look for that little snippet of information in the narrative that can help you work out why things are changing or what is important about this image. And that's how you get your readers to love your story. What is it about that image that is so strange? 
can I work it out for myself? And finally, number seven, a creepy video. Now, of all the plot devices described so far, this is the least popular. It's a very small. Sarah found that only about 6% of the most popular stories um, used a creepy video in them. Basically, it's a lot more difficult to describe a video than it is a picture. Nevertheless, this can also be an effective plot device if used well. Quite recently, I think it was only last week, I narrated a story called 1219, which was basically one about a video in which very little change over the course of many, many hours. And it was effective because the author slowly described the minuscule changes and you were trying to put together what these changes could mean and think about what could happen in the future. So while it's more tricky to describe a video than an image, it can nevertheless be a useful plot device. Okay, so those were the seven key elements that you should bear in mind when writing your creepypasta and careful and skillful use of these plot devices might lead you to writing the next classic. So let's think back to Sarah's research and uh, now we're going to look at the 10 most shared creepypasta stories of all time. Okay, so here's the list. Let's take a look at these. I know. The most shocking thing is you're looking for Slender Man and Jeff the Killer, aren't you? <laughs> now, they're not there because they're not one specific story as such. They've been so pervasive that they've gone across many, many different stories and it's just become more than one story. It's become a phenomenon. So they're not here listed as one particular story for the purposes of research. So please don't get angry about that, okay? All right, so we looked at seven things and right now you're thinking, oh my God, how can I get all seven elements into a creepypasta story? My answer is a very simple one and it's one that's gonna make you happy. You can't, and for the love of God, don't, all right? Let's think about those top 10 shared stories again. How many different elements did each of them have? Let's take a look at each of the elements first. Okay, so here they are. This is the percentage of creepypasta ingredients in the top 10 stories. So let's just take a look at that first one, okay? So we've got first person narrative. 90% of those stories were told from the I did this, I went into the room perspective. Okay, the other important things were, um, most important I should say, were having some kind of supernatural being and some kind of unexplained phenomenon. So, what you might want to do is write a story in the first person that has some kind of unexplained phenomenon and some kind of monster, using three of those ingredients. Why did I list seven? and then say only use three. Well, that's the thing, okay? Trying to get all of those seven things in is just gonna to lead to this horribly mishmashed mess of a story. So you've really gotta choose the elements you want, stick to them, and make it work for you. So, what do I advise? The most shared story of all time is the Russian sleep experiment. This contained four of those creepypasta storytelling ingredients. And another popular one, Squidward's Suicide, also contained four of these elements. Now, some other golden rules suggested by Sarah were that you should have at least two of the ingredients and no more than six. And what we see from those very top stories is that you should include four of these elements in your story. Okay, so there you go. Not as difficult as it may seem, but following these simple steps and looking at the different key elements of the stories should help to keep you on track and keep your story focused and give you a pretty good chance of making your story go viral in the future. Oh, don't forget me. Okay, <laughs> when
When you've written that great story, get in touch. And if I like it, I might just narrate it here on my channel. Okay, good luck with those stories, folks. Hope to be hearing from you soon.